If you're looking for me, I'm not up there. <laughs> I'm up here. You may be seated. If you're looking for a leadership, you don't always have to look to the front to find it. Great leadership doesn't start out on the stage. It doesn't start out as governors or mayors or presidents or CEOs or managers. Great leadership starts out in the back. Today we're going to be talking about leadership, and before you do, we want to prepare your hearts and minds by understanding that leadership starts in the pews. If you're in a church, it starts in the pews. If you're in a business, it starts down in the janitorial booths. It starts with menial things. That's why the Bible said, despise not the day of small beginnings. You have to understand, though, and I want you to get this in your mind and in your heart and most of all in your head about leadership. When you begin to grapple with leadership and life begins to move you along, career opportunities, or I believe the presence of the Holy Spirit begins to move you along because promotion really doesn't come from the east or the west. It really does come from God. It is possible for life to lead you faster than your mind is prepared to handle. God can move you into such a place that positionally you are in a state of leadership but mentally and emotionally, you really haven't got a grip on what life has handed you. And if you don't know what you have, you don't know how to take care of it. If you don't know how to take care of it, you can mess around and lose it. The truth of the matter is, leaders come from ordinary places. They deal with ordinary issues. And I'm going to share some things with you that I think are very, very helpful for you to realize. First of all, I want you to understand that when you're saying to yourself that, you want to be a great leader, and you want to really go the extra mile, and you want to do what has to be done, you're asking for trouble. You are absolutely asking for trouble. You're asking for trouble. And if you think about this a minute, you, you'll learn a very important concept that I think you need to understand. In the corporate world, in the business world, they actually pay you more money as you move up the ladder with more responsibility, okay? So if you are a superintendent, you might not make as much as a general manager. A general manager might not make as much as a regional manager. A CEO would make more than a regional manager. Let me tell you something. They're paying you for conflict. It, it's, uh, are you hearing what I'm saying? It's, it's not enough to have the degrees. What they're paying you for is your ability to manage conflict and pressure and struggles. Let, let me speak it, since I'm in church, let me speak it in biblical language. To him whom much is given, much is required. And so the more that is placed into your hands, the more you have to be able to handle and deal with and to be able to manage it. And I want to say something to you, to those of you, all of us are leaders in some way. All of us are leaders, whether you're leading your children or whether you're leading your family or just leading yourself. Sometimes it's hard to get yourself to act right. But as we go up in levels of leadership and we begin to develop more responsibility, we also begin to embrace more pressure and more problems and more adversity, and new levels bring new devils, bring new challenges, bring new opportunities, more of everything. Somebody just say more of everything. More of everything. So when you say, when you are where you are right now and you say, I can't take this, I can't handle this, I don't want any more, this is driving me crazy, you are saying, I don't want to go any higher. You are rejecting the call to move forward because moving forward and moving up means more problems. In fact, the, the problems that you're dealing with right now may be the fact that you are in training for the next level of leadership. If, if you don't let it break you, if you don't let it destroy you, if you don't wimp out and let it beat you down, if you just master the situation, refuse to be intimidated, and, and learn how to manage 
the stress on the next level, then, then doors swing open. There, there are this, there's this magical thing about life, and I believe it's divinely inspired. You know how you go to the grocery store and you stand at a certain spot, you haven't even gotten to the door yet, but when you get in close proximity, the doors just start opening. When you can stand on a level of life where you're dealing with opposition and pressure and turmoil and take a licking and keep on ticking, and it might have stressed you out. You might have felt the pressure. You might have felt like breaking, but you didn't break. <laughs> Doors just start opening up for you to go to the next level. I'm going to talk more about this in a minute because when I start talking about being, dealing with conflict, all of the conflict is not external conflict. Some of it is internal conflict. Because when you come from back there and you start moving up further and further and further and every step you take takes you to a different level of life and living, sometimes your life is moving faster than your mentality. You can be, have the desk you dreamed about, the position you wanted, the ministry you wanted, the opportunity you wanted, and everything moved up except your perception of yourself. Are you following what I'm saying to you? And we're going to share some things that I believe will prepare you for the next move. And I want you to understand something, that when, when God begins to move you along in life, it's not an elevator, it's, it's a step-by-step -step process. So many people at attempt to move forward in a rapid motion. They want to go from midnight to morning. They want to go from, uh, from the basement to the presidential suite in one step. That's not what you want. You don't want to take the elevator because if you take the elevator and you get it too fast, you can't handle it. You, you can't handle it. Oh, you, I know you want the money, but you can't handle the pressure and the problems and the conflict and the criticism and the opposition. And so God has designed it that you would move along in steps, in stages, not too fast. And every time you take a step, you have to kind of balance yourself and get used to this level of opposition, this level of controversy, this level of conflict, this level of criticism. Because, again, that's what they're paying you for is managing trouble. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? And just as soon as you get it all down pat, and you've mastered it, and you say, good, I'm comfortable now, this is now my new normal, I'm okay with it, then all of a sudden, you take another step. You're back in a situation where you're learning again, and you're being hit in places you never expected to be hit before, and you're dealing with life on another level, and that happens whether you're in a corporation, whether you're in a church, or whether you're a family and you just had another child. Every time you have a child, new conflict, new problems, new things to deal with, more to manage, more to handle. You just got used to having one, you come back from the doctor, now you're getting ready to have two, everything's got to shift, everything's got to move. Everything you learned about the first child doesn't work on the second child. It, Oh, come on, somebody knows what I'm talking about. But, but God is so gracious because he leads you along in steps and stages. And periodically, he will stop the process, allow you to evaluate where you are, to better understand where you are, and put you in a position that you can deal with with your heart and mind and emotions that may still be back there where you started. And people are jealous of you and envious of you and, and fighting you and they don't understand that you still perceive yourself as if you were where you started. But the steps of the Lord are leading you higher and higher and further and further and further than you've ever been before. Touch somebody and say, take another step. There's another step waiting for you. There's another dimension of life, another dimension of leadership, another dimension of problems, another dimension of conflict, another dimension of faith and finances and family and all of that. And if you don't break, and if you don't bow, and if you don't quit, 
And if you can maintain your faith in the middle of conflict and opposition, if you can neutralize controversy and learn how to take a licking, keep on ticking, keep your mind together, keep your wits about you, then God has ordered steps for you. And I want to tell you something, your eyes have not seen, your ears have not heard the things that God has in store for you. He has a blessing for you. He has a promise for you. And all you have to do is stop complaining about where you are. Because when you complain about where you are, you do like Israel. You wander around the wilderness because you're not eligible to make the promotion because you're grumbling about the level you're on right now. You are canceling out the opportunity to go to the next level. If you stop murmuring and complaining and say, I thank you for this conflict. I thank you for this opportunity. I thank you for this controversy. I thank you for this training. I thank you for this opposition. I thank you for this enemy. Order my steps, Lord. Order my steps. Get me ready. I trust you. You wouldn't lead me into this position if you had not equipped me with everything I need for where I am right now. Are you ready for this? Touch three people and say, take another step. 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 Don't be afraid, don't be intimidated, don't bow, don't break, don't give in, don't collapse. All you have to do is take another step. Someone may be stressed out right now, you may be at your wit's end, you may be frustrated, but just touch your neighbor and say, God's got a plan. You may be seated. I've been talking to you about, to the singles, about before you marry. I've been talking to the married people about before you give up, before you divorce, before you throw in the towel. There's some things that we need to understand and think about. And today, I'm going to be talking about before you take the lead. We're always praying for increase. But before you reach out and take the increase, there are some things you need to know. John Quincy Adams said, if your actions inspire others to dream more, to learn more, to do more and become more, then you are a leader. You don't need a title. You don't have to have an office. You don't have to have recognition. But if your actions inspire others to dream more, to do more and to become more, and John Quincy Adams says you are, in fact, a leader. How many people know you're inspirational? I want to, I want to share some things just briefly out of the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 5, verse 1 through 11. I'm going to use it as a jumping off point to jump into a much broader issue, but I'm going to illustrate something here that I think is worth mentioning. The Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 5, verse 1 through 11. And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them. They were washing their nets. He entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. He sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now, when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a drought. Now, you have to understand, Simon, at this point, is not even a disciple. He's a businessman. He owned the fishing company, and he was washing his nets because he thought, you know, there's not going to be any more for me. I'm at my wit's end. This is it for me, and I'll let this little preacher use my boat because I'm not catching anything, and he's washing his nets. He's finished. Jesus now says, because you let me use what you have, I'm going to increase what you have. Now, now when he had left speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a drought. Now, it takes faith, first of all, for Simon, who has washed his nets and thought that his day was over, to go back out there again. It takes faith after failure to try again. Just when you have decided in your own mind, I have gone as far as I'm going to go. 
And maybe it's not meant for me to catch anything. Maybe it's not meant for me to get married. Maybe it's not meant for me to move up any higher. Maybe it's not meant for me to have this position. He's washing his nets. And now the challenge comes, try it again. Some of you are flunking because you're still washing your nets when the word is saying, try it again. And Simon answered and said unto him, Master, we've toiled all night and we've taken nothing. Preacher, you might know something about the word. You don't know anything about fishing. You were raised by a carpenter. What do you know about fishing? He said, but nevertheless at thy word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they enclosed a, a what? A, the old, a great multitude of fish. Can you believe that God got something great for you at a time you were washing your nets? It's amazing how you can go from failure into a massive release of blessing. And it was so much that the Bible says their nets begin to break. And they beckon unto their partners. When, you, when God blesses you, take somebody with you. Which were in the other ships that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships so that they began to sink. Even the partners couldn't withstand the blessing and the release that was coming on them. See, this is a shouting spot right there. Because they went from, from failing and sinking and washing the nets one moment to such a blessing and a release that even the partner's boats began to sink because of the mess. I say that, now I don't say that for the people who are on their way. I say it for the people who have lost their homes or lost your job or had to move back in with your mother or you had to get a used car from the, from the garage place somewhere and you got may pop tires, you know, may pop at any moment and... Uh, and you're sitting around thinking that your life is over, there are some things that God can teach you that can get you back in the game again. Not only restore what you lost, but pull you out more than what you have prepared to be able to receive. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Now watch this, because this is what I really want you to see. I'm not really after this text. I'm after a point. When Simon Peter saw it, when he saw what had happened to him on the next level and the blessing, this is not a problem now, he saw the blessing that God was pouring out on his life. Instead of dancing, shouting, falling out in the floor, talking in tongues and just, just having a spiritual conniption, he fell down at, his, at Jesus' knees saying, depart from me for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Isn't that a weird reaction to a great blessing? He is now taking the lead, and instead of him taking the lead, he's rejecting the opportunity. Because sometimes life will offer you a blessing, but because you still perceive yourself as being in the back, you're not ready to receive the blessing on this next level of life. Not because of external conflict, because now everything externally is going well. But just because things are going well externally doesn't mean that things are going well internally. I'm telling you that your gift can take you some places that your mind isn't ready for, that sometimes your character isn't ready for, that your self-perception isn't ready for, and you will reject the blessing and say, just leave me alone. Leave me back here washing my nets because now you've gone and done it. You've scared me. The Bible says, for he was astonished and all that were with him at the drought of fishes which were taken. And so was all James and John and the sons of Zebedee which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto him, fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. The whole problem was fear. Fear of the next level. Fear of taking the lead fear of going forward. Now, I want to talk about some things with fear. I want to talk about two different dimensions of fear that I want you to understand before you take the lead. I want to talk about the fear of failure. The fear of failure. Because many, many people don't go as far as they should go because they have apprehension that they won't reach their goal. So rather than to try and risk failing, they just say, I'm going to stay down here where I'm at and not try because I might lose. I might lose. I might lose. I'm not going to try anything. I'm not going to own anything because I might lose it. I'm not going to buy a house because I might lose it. I'm not going to get married because I might get a divorce. 
I'm not going to apply for that position because I might not get it. That, that's madness, but that's how it is. Internal conflict. Have you given yourself permission to succeed? Or are you so intimidated by the fear of failure that you don't try? On the other side of it is the fear of success. Being afraid that you will reach your goal, but some disaster may result. These are mixed emotions. I want it, but I don't want all the stuff that comes with it. I don't want to deal with all the problems that come with it. I don't want to deal with all the disasters. I don't want to deal with the pressures that come with it. I can't handle it. I'm going to stay on this lower level. And when you do that and you reject God's opportunity, you are left with nothing but the hope of magic. Magic is when I'm just going to stay down here where it's comfortable, but some kind of magical way I'm believing that I'm going to get a blessing up here while I'm staying down here. You can't do it. It's like believing God that you're going to get pregnant and not gain weight. I'm just, I want the baby, but I don't want the pregnancy. I don't want the weight. I don't want the stretch marks. I don't want any, I don't want to throw up in the morning. No, all of that goes along with the process. And if you will allow anyone, anything, any voice on the inside to talk you out of this moment, you will forfeit it and be stuck washing your nets when there's a great drought of fish waiting you if you have the courage to believe. What really stops us from taking the lead and coming to the forefront, a lot of times it's not the lack of talent, it's not the lack of resources, sometimes it's not the lack of education. I've been amazed at the people I have met who were highly educated and failing. Highly educated and failing. Highly educated and homeless. I, I, I work with a guy who, who has a doctorate in economics and is washing cars just can't seem to get it together. So education alone is not the solution. I'm, I'm for education, I think it's important, it's a good thing or we wouldn't be building, have built the school next door, I think it's very important. But I have seen people educated and stuck. I've worked in penal institutions and seen people who were very gifted and incarcerated. Just because somebody is incarcerated or homeless doesn't mean that they don't have talent. In fact, I've seen people with less talent than you doing more than you. And until you're willing to look that in the face and say, what am I doing to sabotage my own success of moving to the next level, you'll never get there. Until you walk, and, and, and this is what causes jealousy and envy. When you look and you meet other people who have less to work with than you, and yet they're in higher positions than you, you can either become jealous or bitter, or you can begin to challenge yourself to say, what is wrong with my belief systems that's stopping me from going to the next level in this area. Okay, and I want to deal with some irrational beliefs that will stop you from moving up to the next level. This is not about money necessarily. This is not about prestige necessarily. This is about progress. Because it's a shame to live long and have no progress. I want to have progress in every area of my life. I want to see progress in parenting. I want to see progress in my relationship with my wife. I want to see, pro if I'm going to go to work every day, I want to see progress. I've been washing these toilets for 27 years. At least let me be the manager of the toilet washers. In 27 years, I want to move up. Anybody, maybe it's wrong. Is there anybody in here that wants to move up? Okay. I'm going to point out some things that may be hindering you from reaching that, and some of you may already be reaching and you may have already mastered this, just endure this review, okay? I'm going to point out six things, six irrational belief patterns that may be hindering you from going to the next level. One of them is undeserving. I do not deserve the good measure that flows with success. I just don't deserve it. I just can't see myself as being in this position. I don't, I don't deserve it. This often comes from things that people said to you or about you. 
and they have convinced you, they programmed you to, to see yourself in a limited parameter. And so when you see opportunities beyond how you've been programmed, you reject it because you don't feel like you're deserving of it. The other one is beyond undeserving is ordinary. I do not want to stand apart or be different. I want to fit in. You'd be surprised at the people because they have a belief system that, that holds on to being ordinary, they will not take the lead. I, I am afraid that I will become a target, and you will. I want to let me say that to you too, in the name of honesty. If you take the lead, you will become a target. But just because they're shooting at you doesn't mean they shot you. In fact, some of you should rejoice in the fact that, that, that somebody has emptied out their quiver of arrows shooting at you and you are still here. And that person that wouldn't go out and do what you did for fear of being shot at didn't recognize that because of your faith and your convictions, you have been able to pass through the arrows that have been shot at you and survive. But you have to have courage to do that and you have to get rid of your fear to do that and you have to be able to see arrows zinging by you, people hating on you, controversy rising all around you and you have to say like Job, though he slay me, yet shall I trust him. The third belief system that may be hindering you is social change. I fear rejection, loneliness, or claims that I have changed or sold out. I don't, I don't want to be rejected by my sociological environment. And this is very, very important uh, to minorities. Because when you are a minority, there, there is a clannish survival mechanism that fits in. No matter what kind of minority you are in any situation. I was uh, in Mexico a, a while ago, and a gentleman came up and said to me, if you're going to rent a boat, because I like to rent boats and go fishing, he said, if you're going to rent a boat, rent a boat for me because I'm an American. Because in that setting, he was a minority. And the idea is we have to stick together. Watch out for wheeze. Because people will control you with a we. And you will miss your opportunity at what may be the best deal for you trying to be loyal to the we. It's what we teach our children about peer pressure. And all of a sudden, in order to fit in in your sociological environment, you passed up the promotion. You wouldn't buy the house that was the best deal for you because it moved you out of the neighborhood that you were defined by. You passed up the position that you wanted to take because now your girlfriends won't like you because you're now managing the girls you used to run with. And so in order to fit in, you're going to stay in the seat that I started this sermon from rather than to take your rightful place behind this rostrum because you want the people people you're sitting beside to like you and accept you. Oh. And you don't want to be a sellout. Oh my. The, the next one I want to deal with is fleeting. My success will be temporal and I will not be able to sustain it. You have performance anxiety. You're afraid that it won't last. It won't last. Good things won't last. You don't want to go out on a date because if he does, if you go out on the date and you start a relationship and things start going well, it's not going to last. I did not go last. It didn't last with four. It didn't last with Fred. It didn't last with Jim. It's not going to last. I'm not going to take this position because if I get in this position, I may lose this job. It's not going to last. I'm not going to go back to school because I may not complete it. It will not last. And you have a fear that the blessing is fleeting. So you won't get back out on the boat and throw your nets again because you have already programmed yourself that nothing else exciting is ever going to happen to you again. And as I go through these belief systems, I want you to look for the ones that sound like you. <laughs> Have I hit anything yet? Yeah. The next one I want to talk about is perfectionism. I will have to behave as if I am perfect and I am not. I believe this was part of Peter's problem. When he saw the power of God to bless him, he recognized the power of God to destroy him. 
Think about that. When he saw the power of God to bless him, he recognized the power of God to destroy him. He said, get out of here, Jesus. Depart from me. Why? Because I know I've got imperfections. And I don't want to get in the light because somebody might see them. And so I'm going to be secretly talented. I'm going to sing at home. I'm going to leave the church and say what they ought to do and what somebody ought to say and what somebody ought to write a book about that and somebody ought to get up and say something. And I'm going to drive home locking my treasure up inside of me because I am imprisoned by my imperfections and I don't want anybody to know that I'm not perfect even though I'm good at this, I'm weak at that. Peter said, look, you've made me a great fisherman but I'm a sinful man, go. I reject the opportunity to be blessed because I know something about myself that I don't want anybody else to know and I'm more concerned about the security of my reputation than I am my progress. Hmm. Perfectionism. I'm not going to get involved with him because if I get involved with him and he gets too close to me, he will see that I'm not perfect. being able to balance your imperfection. And they, they may not even be moral imperfections. In, in the case of dating, it may be physical imperfection. Oh no, he couldn't physically want me, I'm too fat. Where, where you don't give the person the chance to accept you because you've already criticized yourself over and over. You'd be surprised at the people who talk other people out of loving them. Convince them that you're not a try to, oh, no, no, Lord, no, no, look at me, no, God, oh, God, no. <laughs> you know exactly what to do to move up into the next position, but you don't want the light on you because you have issues. Newsflash, everybody has <laughs> issues. Pastor Robinson just shouted out junk in the trunk. Everybody has junk in the trunk. And if you're waiting to clean out all the junk before you put your pedal to the metal and drive and go forward, you may be stuck 20 years cleaning out the trunk. Hmm. I'm going to go on to this next one. Besiegement. I will be besieged by others wanting things from me. My loved ones will feel entitled to a measure of my success. I don't want all the controversy that goes along with this. I don't want this. I don't want this. Don't give me the power of attorney, mama, because I don't want to deal with my sisters and brothers. I don't want the, don't give me the position because if I become manager of the department, my friends won't invite me out anymore. And you start doing crazy things, trying to prove to them that you are still who you were because people will put pressure on you to stay low and all of a sudden you're afraid that they're going to demand things from you. And it is true, as you go up, there are a great deal of people who associate with you because of where you are and not who you are. <laughs> and, and, and people start fighting over your level of success. If you don't believe it, talk to any NFL athlete, anybody who goes pro in sports. All of a sudden people change when they think you got a little something, something. And all of a sudden it was just fine. They normally would just be talking about everything in life, but people have a way of, of having these little conversations. You know, child, I'm going through. I'm just going through. I'm just going through. I'm just going through. My, my rent's like three months behind, man. I know it ain't no big deal for somebody got all the kind of money you got because you low, you, you don't have to deal with no kind of stuff like this. But you know, uh, $2,400 would set me straight. That's probably changed to you, but man, I'm telling you. The pressure is so great. When I was in South Africa years ago and, and, and the first generation of, of blacks in South Africa who were oppressed in the apartheid were now freed and becoming successful, that some of the articles said some of them were ready to leave South Africa because so many people were pulling and clawing at them. Because when you first start going up amongst people who haven't gone up, they have a tendency to be like crabs in a barrel and they start trying to pull you down because they say, you know, you're the first one 
someone in our family to get a degree. You ought to take care of this and you ought to take care of that. And after a while, they pull you down so low. Some of you know what I'm talking about. They pull you down so low. That, and some people, for fear of having that pressure on them, forfeit the success and stay down rather than to go forward. I'm preaching. <laughs> The inability to manage these fears creates self-sabotaging, self-handicapping situations where you're un incapable of moving forward because you just can't handle the pressure on this level. It's, and it makes you a chronic underachiever. A chronic underachiever. And when you start going up too high, you do little things subconsciously sometimes, unconsciously sometimes, to sabotage the next move so you can stay down here where it's safe. The maybe they'll like me better syndrome keeps you locked into a system that you can't get out of. It's true. It's true. And if you don't give yourself permission to go forward, you will cancel out your opportunity to lead, not because of external conflict, I'm gonna get to that next, but because of internal conflict, you are tripping over your own foot. You're talking that man out of your life. You're talking your boss to give that assignment to somebody else because you don't want to shine out and end up dealing with another level of problems and so you're going to stay down here where, you, where you're comfortable and you'll never become all that you can be because you can't deal with the conflicts you have inside of you. Are you following me? Now we're going to get to something else. We're going to talk about the external conflicts because you will have them. There is no way that you can go up and not have external conflicts. There is no way you can go where others have not gone and not find debris and obstacles in the way. That is to say that if you're a leader, now if you're a follower, you don't have to listen to this because whoever you're following will clear a path for you. And so you can just walk in their footsteps and get right behind them and say, ooh, this is so nice. This is so cool. This is so good. Thank God for all of those who've gone before me and cleared the way. But if you're a leader and you go where none have ever gone before, you encounter the sticker briars, you encounter the thorns, you encounter the adversity, and you're clearing a path for the next generation. You are supposed to have external conflicts anytime you are a trailblazer. You are going to have external conflicts because you are doing something that has never been done before. It will be defined often after you're dead. You'll be gone before people understand you. And if you have a need to be understood, you'll never go any further because you're doing something new. And whenever you do something new, people always reject it at first. Whenever you're doing something new, people always reject it at first. So if your need to be accepted becomes more, more powerful than your need to go and do something fresh, you will backtrack, you will just moonwalk like Michael Jackson going all the way back into the safety zone. And whether you know it or not, you are imprisoned by fear. You're, how many trailblazers do I have in here? Trailblazers clear the way and confront the conflict in a strategic, non-emotional way. You can't be a trailblazer and be all emotional. Oh, God, and one more thing, Jesus. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord, God, what else? Clearing the debris in a non-emotional way. Dealing with the conflict without being hysterical. The whole department is freaking out and everybody's upset. You can't be the manager and walk in the room and say, that's right. <laughs> Leaders have to be the voice of reason. Can you deal with the external conflict in a non-emotional way? Your detachment from it emotionally is an expression of faith that you can handle it. Why would you become emotional about something you are called to fix? Do you notice how calm Jesus was when he heard Lazarus was dead? 
and it was his friend. And Jesus said, oh, God, no, 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 not Lazarus, no, no. Oh, God, not Lazarus. Anybody but Lazarus. I've been to Lazarus' house. I stayed. The reason he was calm, he was called to fix what other people were hysterical about. And if you believe that you can fix it, then why are you screaming? You either are going to be emotional or rational. Boxers will tell you, you will lose the fight if you get too angry. The moment they got, that's why they're talking, I'll knock you out, I'll kill you, I'll kill your unborn children, I'll kill your mama and your grandmama. And they're trying to get you to be angry because when you're emotional, you're not rational. And winning is strategic. Touch three people and say, think like a winner, think like a winner, think like a winner. <laughs> now, 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 if you don't understand this, you can only go so far. Now, there, there are degrees of leadership. I want to talk a little bit about this. There are degrees of leadership. You can be a leader. You can be a leader and not be the leader. So you don't want to just keep going up beyond your giftings and callings. You may be a leader and you may be called to lead in a myopic style. You can lead over a particular thing. You can lead over a particular dimension of a bigger organization. You don't want to be the CEO of the company, but you want to manage the marketing department. You say, I can handle this on this level. Don't let people push you beyond your competence. So you, you have to understand when you, you want to be challenged, yes, you want to be stretched, but you don't want to pop. A rubber band is designed to be stretched. And when you stretch it, you're using it the way it was designed to be used. But if you overstretch it, you're going to break it. Have you learned your limitations? Do you know what's too much for you? What are your breaking points? What are your boundaries? Because if you don't know your boundaries, you don't know what would pop you. If you're going to be the leader, you can't have a 90-degree dimension of leadership and vision. You have to be able to see 360. 360. Now, when you are the leader talking to leaders, you have a room full of 90s, and you're a 360. And I'm going to tell you, it is a very difficult thing to have a conversation with a room full of 90s when you're a 360 thinker. Because the 90 degree person will get angry because you made a decision that wasn't great for their department. But because you are in charge of the whole vision, you have to make a 360 decision and not a 90 degree decision and you have to be strong enough to withstand the conflict that comes from your own team Because they are a myopic thinker, they think in a tunnel, and you hired them to think in a tunnel, and they're supposed to think in a tunnel, and they're supposed to be thinking about what's best for the marketing team, what's best for the publications, what's best for this department, what's best for that department, what's best for the choir, or whatever it is, but that is not your role. And if you stop thinking 360 and start thinking 90, then you become a micromanager and you come down from your position and there you are directing the choir instead of doing what you're supposed to be doing. Am I saying anything that's helping anybody? You, when you are the leader, whether you're the leader of your house, it's a great deal of difference between a woman who is, the, who is the head of her house, a single mother, and how she thinks and how she has to make decisions as opposed to a married woman who has a husband and she has the luxury of thinking on one level, whereas you, you have to think like a woman and deal like a man. Because there's nobody for you to come home and tell them what happened at work and I need you to go down and straighten those people out and the mechanic lied to me. You have to be the person who's been lied to and the person who goes down there and say, wait a minute, this receipt said. Now both women are a leader, 
But when you are the one in charge, you are the leader, and you have to think in a 360 and not in a 90. Are you following me? Now, when you do that, you're going to have some conflict. You're going to have some conflict from people who are legitimately with you. So you have to be a leader enough to understand that somebody can disagree with you and still be with you. And you have to have the wisdom to understand they disagree with you because from their perspective, it was not the best decision. Because they looked at, like for instance in this ministry, they looked at how many people we could feed if you brought the restaurant truck and you didn't do it. You looked at, in order to buy the restaurant truck, we need more finances than what we have. It is a great idea, but buying the truck will sink the entire organization. So are you leader enough to have a disagreement with somebody without starting to dislike the person because they disagreed with you, understanding that that disagreement doesn't mean betrayal. But because your life ability has put you in a 360 position, but you still have a back row mentality, now you're in a position with an old mentality that makes you so sensitive to anybody saying anything to you that rather than think, you fight. And you drive away people who were with you because they didn't understand the difference between being a leader and being the leader. That's a good clapping point right there. You missed it, but. So that brings me to my next point. So you have to become comfortable with controversy. Now we all have controversy, but before you take the lead, before you take the lead, you have to become comfortable with controversy. And what I love about God is that God will expose you. Let me, I gotta come all the way down here. God will expose you to controversy on this level. So that, the only reason you're getting it on this level is so that you'll get tough enough to handle the controversy on this level. And then when you get to this level, about the time you get used to being shot at at this level, he calls you on up to this level, and then to this level, and then to this level. And when you get up here, you want to go down there and thank all the people who fought you on this level, and this level, and this level, because they trained you to be able to handle controversy. God is preheating the oven getting you ready so that you are now comfortable with what you are called to do because controversy is part of the call. You, either you will be controversial or what you did will be controversial. You will get it both ways. Some will, I don't like him. Others, I don't like what he did. Most people will say, I don't like him. Because most people are back row thinkers. They don't even think, uh, I don't know him. <laughs> they will bypass the fact that they don't know you and decide that they don't like you. What they really mean is I don't like what you did but they haven't progressed in their thinking enough to be able to communicate effectively. So they say, I don't like him. And if somebody would tap on their shoulder and say, have you met him? <laughs> so from this day forward, I want you to make me a commitment that you will never again say that you don't like somebody that you don't
Controversy is so much a part of leadership. When I think of illustrations, I could think of, of some contemporary ones. All you have to do is look at the election and you can see that controversy is a part of leadership. But I won't use that one. I'll use Moses. I, I, I will bypass the opportunity to point out that the race to the White House is training you for the hell in the White House. Just because you're trying to do a good thing doesn't mean that you're going to be recognized for doing a good thing. And so as you moved into leadership, I want to get rid of that, that sensitive heart that you have from being on the back row and toughen it up a little bit to understand that not only will you have controversy from the people on the outside, but also the very people that you're trying to help will be fighting you while you're trying to help them. If you don't believe that, ask Moses what happened to him when he started leading the children of Israel out of Egypt, trying to save them and save their situation. He got more grief from the children of Israel than he did from Pharaoh because often the people you're trying to help the most will be fighting you the most. I can't believe he brought us out here to die. He should have left us alone, kept us back there in Egypt where we were, kept us comfortable, kept us safe. And all the while he's trying to save them, they're trying to destroy him. He said, he doesn't know what he's doing. He must be crazy. And you're trying to help people that are hurting you and you're fighting off this over here and you're trying to fight off them over there and all of that you must become comfortable with if you're going to be a leader. How many of you have ever tried to help somebody who was hurting you? In fact, Moses becomes a good illustration of it, but as a leader, you need to develop the weaponry of Nehemiah. Nehemiah is a great illustration of great leadership because Nehemiah is building back the walls of Jerusalem, which is helping the people of Jerusalem while he is being fought on every side. And he begins to build the wall with a trial in one hand, a trial. But you cannot become so distracted by what you are called to do that you don't have a sword in the other hand to fight the people who are trying to kill your destiny. So you've got to have a two-handed approach to leadership, building with one hand and fighting with the other. I got something for you this morning. I got something for you that's going to change how the rest of your year turns out. You can't stop building and just become engrossed in fighting, and you can't stop fighting and become engrossed in building. That's why God gave you two hands. Build with one and fight with the other. Tell somebody, say, don't forget you got two hands. Don't forget you got two hands. You got two hands. You can't stop building and you can't stop battling. You got to battle and build, battle and build, battle and build, battle and build, battle and build. In fact, the more you build, the more you battle. The more you build, the more you battle. The more you build, the more you battle. And finally, you get to a place where the folks who were fighting you will change their mind and the wicked shall cease from troubling and the weary shall be at rest. Tell somebody, say, I'm almost there, I'm almost there, I'm almost there. Whew. Are there any two-handed people here this morning? To him whom much is given, much is required. You cannot build anything that won't bring a battle. 
And if you're going through a battle right now, it's only because you're building something. Because people don't fight people who don't build. They'll only fight you. Look at your neighbor and say, the battle is because you're building. If you weren't building anything, nobody would battle you. If you weren't going forward, they wouldn't fight you. But the more you start building, the more you got to battle. Think it not strange that these trials have come upon you. This is a part of your job. Why are you here this morning? Because you're next. I was talking to uh, Andy Young, and you know who he is and what a trailblazer he's been in, in this nation, not only working in our government, working in the civil rights movement, and just seeing so many things happen, and we were having a conversation. And I was talking about the complexities of the time that, that we're in right now, the controversy that goes along with it, and the, the criticisms that you have to deal with, and, 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 and all of that. And I said, you know, it's just, just terribly perplexing times now to be a leader and to be out front. He said, oh, he said, that's not anything new. I was looking for a little sympathy hookup, you know. <laughs> he said, I was with Dr. King. He said, they were fighting him on every side. He was put out of his denomination. I'm not talking about, you hear about the FBI side and, and all of that, but you don't hear because those who are preaching and saying they are the next Dr. Kings were the very ones who put him out. He said they were fighting him internally, they were fighting him externally, they were bugging his house, they were fighting him on every side, not to mention your own personal problems. And he said, yeah, it's some kind of way, Bishop. He said, we managed to make progress. He said, I don't know how we did it. He said, there was always murmuring and complaining and bickering and we didn't know from day to day what was gonna happen. We didn't agree amongst ourselves while we were marching. Sometimes we were debating issues, but some kind of way, we made progress until eventually we began to understand that we could not wait for the controversy to stop for the movement to go forward. And so I thought it was worth telling you, since you might not get to talk to Andy Young, that you can't wait for the controversy to stop for your movement to go forward. You just got to let them say whatever they're gonna say, fight them back, and keep on building. I'm going to borrow one of Paula White's statements and say, slap your neighbor upside the head and say, you're next. <laughs> Can I go just a little bit further? Surely you ought to think that Jesus was a great leader. Watch Jesus when he says to his disciples, who do men say that I am? Here comes controversy. You're controversial, Jesus. Some say that thou art Elias. Some say that thou art Jeremiah. Some say that thou art Esaias. And you are so controversial that your enemies don't agree. Now that's when it's getting good. When your enemies don't agree, you're getting good. Then he says to his followers, who do you say that I am? Now, before I quote what Peter said, let me, let me underscore that it is not Peter's statement that amazes me. It is not the statement of the one that amazes me. It is the silence of the 11. Who do you say that I am? 11 disciples said nothing. So often when you are in leadership, you are leading people who do not know who you are.
if you can get one out of 12 to understand who you are, then you're doing as good as Jesus anyway. You're doing pretty good. If one guy will speak up for you and say, thou art the Christ, I know who you are. You're the president of this company. I know who you are. You're the mastermind behind this project. I know most people who are sitting under you don't have a clue who you are and they don't value who you are because they don't understand what they have. And if you don't understand what you've got, you can fool around and lose what you got because you don't understand the magnitude of what has been given. Again, to him whom much is given, much is required. That's not just on the person on the stage, but it's also on the people who are following them. It is much required of you to follow somebody close enough to have a clue who you've got. Anybody who's in leadership, you're leading somebody who doesn't know who, uh, who you are, you're struggling to do it because you're being underappreciated, you are being become frustrated, people will handle you any kind of way because they don't know the value of what they have. Your temptation is to walk away from people you're trying to help who don't know who you are. One guy says, thou art the Christ, the son of the true and living God. I know who you are. I figured out, I have followed you long enough to know who you are. And on the basis of that knowledge, Peter gets to preach the inaugural message at the birthing of the church because you cannot pass your mantle to people who do not know who you are. I wish I don't have time to do this justice because look at Elijah and Elijah and Elijah says, I want a double portion of Elijah's spirit. He said, no, not yet. You haven't seen enough. When you've gone through this with me and that with me and the other with me and that way, and if you're still here when I'm taken up, now I'm going to give you a double portion of my glory because you can't have my mantle if you don't know who I am. Ooh. Marriages are being lost because of it. Companies are being lost because of it. Family relationships are torn. Anytime you have any kind of structure and you have to lead people who don't know who you are, you're in trouble. I want to move on. Can I go further? Yes. This is my last, last Sunday to do this, so just bear with me just a little bit. The other thing I want you to understand that you have to have in order to be a leader is commitment. You have to be the last one to leave the ship. If you're gonna lead, you have to hang tough. You cannot inspire people to follow your lack of commitment. You cannot inspire people to follow your lack of commitment. You cannot inspire people to follow your lack of commitment. People follow what they admire. You have to have the mentality that I'm going to be committed to this, and if you're going to be a great leader, do not commit to more than your competence. Have you ever seen people that volunteer for everything? I'm going to be in the choir, I'm going to be in the usher board, I'm going to be in this, I'm going to be in that, and then I'm going to be in that. I'm going down to the Salvation Army, I'm going to do this, and, and their heart go, is so big that their head is shrinking. And in order to be effective, <laughs> didn't that give you a visual? Did you say, help, help. Like, like the wicked witch of the web, I'm shrinking, I'm shrinking, I'm shrinking. That's what's happening to the brain. It's just shrinking, just shrinking. Because anything you're in charge of, you have to be committed to. You have to be committed to it. And if you're not committed to it, you're not going to be effective at it. And in order to be committed to it, you can't do it just for the check. You can buy competence, but you cannot buy commitment. Commitment has to come from the heart. It's a heart thing. It's not a check thing. It's a heart thing. It's not a check thing. And I want you to close the gap between 
where you get your money from and what you're committed to. Because if you're making money over here, but you're committed over there, eventually it's going to pull you apart. What you really want to do is be able to make your money where your commitment is, and then you will get paid for doing what you would do for free. Does anybody understand what I just said? That's a good old shouting point right there. Number five, I want to talk about character. I want to talk about character because if you have commitment without character, you get Hitler. <laughs> commitment without character leads to all types of human atrocities. Anytime somebody is committed to something but they don't have character to undergird their commitment, it leads to monarchies, it leads to travesties, it need, leads to degradation, it leads to slavery, it leads to all types of human abuses of every kind where people are committed without character. So do you have character enough to take the lead? Character, to do what's right when everything's going wrong. Commitment without character leads to chaos. It is not so important. In fact, let me say it this way. You need to set some boundaries for yourself. Set some boundaries. It may not be important to, important to determine what you will do as much as it is to be clear about what you won't do. So if you're trying to establish character, don't look so much at what you will do because before life is over, in order to lead anything, you may have to do things that you never thought you'd have to do. You may have to sweep the floor and take out the trash if you're going to be a leader. You may have to mop up the kitchen even though you're the manager of the restaurant. You may have to do a whole lot of things that are not on your job description. So don't worry about what you will do. Character is determined by what you won't do. You say, I'm not going to sell out. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to take money out of the cash register. What will you not do? And the more you can determine what you will not do, the more we can get a picture of your character. Is there anything that you won't do to get ahead? That ought to help you when you're dating somebody. Check out what they won't do. And if you want to know about somebody's character, watch how they treat people they don't need. Because people are always good to people they have to have. If you want to know whether their character is real good, I watch little things. Did you tip the bellman? Did you give something to the sky cab? Are you nice to the waitress? Because I'm trying to figure out who you really are. I know you're going to be nice to me because we're getting ready to do business. But I'm watching how you treat people that you perceive that you don't need. That is a sign of your character. Something is about to happen. 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 Normally when I'm in this vein and I'm teaching along this lines, something always breaks out, something always breaks loose. It's a setup for somebody. It's a setup for somebody. Somebody's getting ready to go to the next level. Doors are getting ready to open up for somebody. They're getting ready to break into another dimension. I don't know who I'm teaching. I don't know why you had to be here today, but something is about to happen before you do. Tell somebody, say, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. Oh God, I gotta stop. I'm not supposed to be shouting, but I feel a good old, I feel a good old Holy Ghost shout. I feel a shift. I feel a supernatural release. You know why? The last shall be first. The tail is going to become the head. There's going to be a shifting in here from the background to the forefront before you do. You got to get ready for what, come on, clap your hands, something's about to happen. I got one more thing to do, I'm going to get out of your way. Tell somebody, say, we got to build a team, we got to build a team. You got to build a team. We got to build a team. We got to build a team. Because we're getting ready to go someplace we've never gone before. 
We're getting ready to do things that we've never done before. We're getting ready to ascend to a height that we've never seen before. We're going to deal with some conflict that we never had before. We're going to face some controversy that we never had before. We're going to have some conflicts that we've never had to deal with before. But that's all right because we've got some character. We've got some character. And we've got some commitment. And we've got some staying power. Now we're going to pick the team. These are the people that you're going you're gonna to ride with. You're going to ride shotgun with. These are going to be your road dogs and your running buddies. <laughs> Woo. My God, something is about to happen. I'm going to show you how to pick your team. The Bible spends more time showing us how Jesus picked his team than it does telling us about what he did. Most of the Gospels is spent telling you how he met his team. Because it's all about the 12, not the 5,000. It's about the 12 choosing the right team. Now, can I give you some things for the right team? I'm going to give you these final three. Some of you have heard this before. Some of you have not. I'm going to give you these final three criteria to choose your team. One, you're going to have confidence. Okay. You're going to have confidence. you got to have confidence. you got to trust somebody. You cannot be a great leader and not have anybody you can talk to. You got to have somebody you can talk to and be honest and be open and say, this is how it really is. I'm really stressed out. I'm sick of all of them. I'm frustrated. It's getting on my nerves. You got to have a confidant, somebody with whom you can be transparent and be honest. Out of the 12, you got to have some three, some inner circle that get close around you. These are the guys you carry up on the Mount of Transfiguration. These are the road dogs who run with you and they see you and they understand you and they're your confidants. And if you have three in a lifetime, you've done real good. If you have three confidants in a lifetime that you can really trust and talk to and open up to, you've done real good. So this category is your smallest category. They're your confidants. They are people who are with you. They are with you. If you go up, they're with you. If you go down, they're with you. If you get stuck, they're with you. If everybody starts dogging on you and hating you, they're still with you. If you have three, you've done really well. They know what you're afraid that somebody else will find out. And they're still with you. These are the people that being around them is so comfortable, you can behave as if you were by yourself. You don't get tired of your confidence because you don't have to change your behavior in their presence. The reason you get tired of being around people is because you're putting on. And you want them to leave so you can relax. But there is somebody that doesn't have to leave for you to relax because they're your confidants. They know who you really are. Oh my God, I'm teaching so good. I think I might get this tape myself. The confidence commitment is to you, not to your cause. It is to you, not to your cause. The confidant is in it with you because of you, not because of your cause. You are the center of their gravitational pull. And if you have confidence, you have to remember to feed your confidants you. Because the confidant is not in it for the money, they're not in it for the prestige, they're not in it for the recognition, they're not in it for the title, they're in it because of you. And if you start starving your confidants of your attention, they will wither up and die because their only attraction was not to the cause, it was always to you. I lost a very good employee one time over this because I thought the guy was coming because of the cause and in fact, he was coming because of me and it, it didn't work out well in the position because working in the position gave him less and less of me until he finally got frustrated and left. I thought he left over the money or left over the stress and later when we did the debriefing, he left because he couldn't spend time with me. His commitment was to me and not to the cause. 
If you get that twisted, you will be feeding them things that would motivate anybody else and they'll be withering because a confidant lives and breathes off of their relationship with you. Oh, this is good. The second category is your constituents. Your constituents. Your constituents are with it. They are with it. They are with the cause, not you. They are only with you because of the cause. They will confuse you because they look just like a confidant. They're walking right beside you just like a confidant. They talk the same language as a confidant, but they are there because of the cause and not because of you. These are constituents. Their attraction is the mission. Now, you can still have them with you, but you have to know why they're with you. They are with you as long as you are getting them closer and closer to the mission. And, and they walk just like the confidant, but understand that the constituent will leap out of your fellowship and jump onto another person's fellowship because it's helping to get them closer to where they're trying to go. It was never about you in the first place. It was about the cause. And if it furthers their agenda, they'll leave you in a heartbeat and leave you with your heart broken because you thought they loved you. They never loved you. They love what you do. And when they met somebody who could take them there quicker, they left you because it was never about you. It was about it. These are constituents. These three categories are divided by motives. The difference between the constituent and the confidant is motives. They do the same thing, but they do it for different reasons. And the reason people get it confused is because they're both doing the same thing. They're both working. They're both standing right beside you. They're both in it to win it. They're both trying to encourage you. They're both fighting a good fight. One of them will be with you even if the cause goes down. One of them will be with you even if somebody comes and offers them a quick road to get there without you. But the other one, if they see a quicker route, or if they think it might be a quicker route, they will leave you in a heartbeat. Well, I'm not going to pick anybody like that. You cannot have a room full of confidants. You have to be able to work with people who come and go. Am I helping anybody? These are constituents, they come and go. They come and go. I like to call them scaffolding. Scaffolding goes right up against the building. It snuggles up against the building. It's so tight up against the building, you can't get in between the scaffolding and the building. But when the building is up, the scaffolding goes. Some people come in your life to get you to your next destination. They didn't come to stay, they came to leave. You have to love them when they come and love them when they go and say, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Don't get bitter over constituents. If you get bitter over constituents, it's because your mentality is still back up there on that back row. And you don't understand that you have to be a 360 thinker in order to handle it. I don't know whether I ought to give you all this, my good stuff. Can, can I give you a little bit more of this? So you've got these, you've got these constituents and, the, and they come, and this is driving pastors today crazy because past, people today join churches for different reasons than ever before. Sometimes it's not their commitment to the pastor at all. It's not their commitment to uh, the, 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 him or his, his charisma or anything about that. Sometimes they'll join the church because the church feeds homeless people. 
and they have a passion for that, and they come and join their church, because your church, because it doesn't have anything to do with your preaching. In fact, while you're preaching, they have their hand in soup out. And then when, when they leave, the pastor is angry. You can't get angry about that, man. You can't get angry. Thank God you serve some soup. God bless you. Let's try this. Let's try this. Everybody. Oh, you did that good. Oh, you did that good. You did that good. Now, can you do that and not be bitter? Because in order for you to stay pure as a leader, if you don't get this now, you're going to become bitter and cynical and start fighting and lose the thing that got you there in the first place. As a leader, you have to be able to rejoice when people come, rejoice when they go. You, you got to be even killed because you, you got to know you're going to have all, all those different types of people. You got to know that everybody that comes doesn't stay. You cannot have a love affair with a temp. You knew when she came, she was going to work six months. That's why you call temporary services. No, I'm not working. See, you got to understand what I'm working on. I'm not working on the people that are coming and going. I'm working on the leader whose heart is broken about the people who are coming and going because you are feeling like you're up there, but you are living like you're right here. And I'm trying to get those things to come together that you begin to get the mentality of the position that you're in. I didn't blow the kiss to be uh, crass. I'm talking about the attitude of greatness necessitates that you do more than love when they come. You have to, for survival's sake, get to the point that you can handle people leaving. Touch your neighbor and say, can you handle the truth? And while you're going through this, God will let people leave you and leave you and leave you until he trains you. And after a while they can leave you and you still be cool. Hi, how you doing? Because you understand it wasn't about you. And when you have people in your life who are there for you, then you don't desperately need everybody in your whole world to be there for you. I'm trying to get you not to have a personal attitude in a professional situation. Because most people are living out their personal need in public places. Oh, God, give me this tape. I'm taking this tape. Give me two of them. Okay, so we got, <laughs> we, we got, we got, what do we have? Confidants. And, and we got constituents number three, we're gonna do comrades. Comrades, comrades, I'm your comrade. I'm in the fight with you. We will not stop, we will not deter, we will not desist until we have destroyed. I am here to help you fight. I am not for you. I am not for your cause. I am not for you. I am not what you are. I am not for what you are for. I am for what you are against. I joined up with you to help you fight what you are against. Lord have mercy. Comrades, when you are in a fight, and somebody joins you in the fight, don't think they're your friend because they join you in the fight. It may not be their attraction to you that made them fight beside you. It may be their frustration against your enemy that says, Eve, I hate you so bad that even if I have to fight with her to get you, I'm gonna get you out of the way. 
And so they are your comrades. The Pharisees and the Sadducees didn't even like each other. But when Jesus came along, they both got, oh, I can speak it in any language. The Pharisees and the Sadducees had been hating on each other for years. But when Jesus came along, they both got together and they came to question Jesus. Those are comrades. Now watch this. Ooh. 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 Touch your neighbor and say, I see my team. 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 I understand now. Whether I'm running a beauty shop or a computer business, I'm going to have confidants. I'm going to have constituents. And I'm going to have comrades. And when it serves the purpose, of moving what I'm the leader of forward, I will hook up with whoever I have to hook up with to do what I've got to do to get to the next level. There's nothing wrong with that as long as I understand which one of you is which. Don't let me get lonely and confide in a comrade because then when the fight is over, you're going to use what I told you to kill Oh, y'all don't to talk to me. I'm helping somebody. I don't know who it is. See, that's what happened to you. You say your friend betrayed you, but they were never your friend in the first place. They didn't betray you, Sister Betty. They were never for you. They were just along for the ride to help you fight who you were fighting against. And then they will use what you confided in them to destroy you. Because one thing you can count on a fighter to do is fight. Now, we got your character, you understand your conflict, you understand your constituents and your comrades and your confidants. Now you've done it. Now you've done it. You have set yourself in the position that God was waiting on you to get in, to take you to the next dimension. Now you have done it. You have planted your feet firmly on the promises that you have inside, and you're now ready to go where none have never gone before and do what none have never. Now you've done it. You have determined that you're a blessed man or a blessed woman. And now that you understand that you are blessed, whatsoever you do shall prosper. Your leaf shall not wither. You're going to bring forth fruit in your own season. And everything you touch is going to prosper. You're not going to be set back by your fears. You're not going to be delayed by your emotions. You're not going to have to heal from your past pain. You know who you are. You know where you are, and most importantly, you know who they are. And once you know who they are, you can look up and say, I know whose I am, and I know who I am. Now you've done it. The demons are trembling. Hell is nervous. Satan is restless because you no longer believe that you have to stay in the back when you're called to the forefront. You're a leader call for such a time as this and I want to tell you this no weapon formed against you shall be able to prosper and every tongue that rises against you God will condemn for the battle is not yours it belongs to God so buckle up your bootstraps gird your loins about your waist 
and go into the enemy's camp and take back. Give me my house back. Give me my career back. Give me my job back. Give me my promotion back. Touch somebody and say, I'm going after my stuff. I'm going after my stuff. I'm going after my stuff. I'm going in the enemy's camp. I'm going to get it back. Give me my peace. Give me my joy. Give me my deliverance. Give me my integrity. Give me my authority. Give me my vision. Give me my purpose. Give me my goals. Give God a praise right now. Just say, do it, do it. When you get to the fifth one, give God a crazy, Holy Ghost, supernatural, divine. Do it, do it, do it, do it. Do it. On your mark, get set, go! I need you to help me. Somebody's been right on the verge of greatness. You've been right on the verge of blessings. That's why you've been in the battle, because you're on the verge of blessing. But I pray that this message would be the tipping point that tips you over the edge. Shake your neighbor by the hand and say, on your mark. Touch 
watch that same neighbor and say, get set. Before the year is over, slap him again and holler, God!